All right, we're all set. Uh, the webinar has begun. Thank you for those online that are joining us at the One Health Academy tonight. Uh, just to get started, I wanted to say thank you to ASM again for hosting us in person and for all of you that are cozy on your couches right now, tuning in remotely. Thank you to the One Health Commission for allowing us this ability to have the webinar. Um, so we're super grateful for both, both groups for their, their support and we ask that you support them in any way that you can. Um, because they make all of this possible. So thank you so much, the One Health Commission and American Society of Microbiology. I'll go ahead and start our webinar uh, by introducing Anna Maria Castiglia, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Anna Maria. Thank you. thank you, Blair. Hi, I'm Anna Maria Castiglia, and I forgot to say I work for the Center for Veterinary Medicine. I'm a veterinarian as well, and I can say that Dr. Solomon is my big <laughs> okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce him today to all of you, and I'm really glad to see the crowd that's here today. It's great, both uh, web-wise and also in the room. So let me tell you a little bit about this wonderful man that we have right here with us today. Um, he was appointed as Director of Food and Drug Administration Center for Veterinary Medicine in January 2017. Previously, he served as the Deputy Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs within the Food and Drug Administration Office of Regulatory Affairs. He joined FDA in 1990 as a veterinary medical officer in the Center for Veterinary Medicine and served in various policy leadership positions in the Office of Regulatory Affairs, Office of Enforcement, Office of Regional Operations, and as an Assistant Commissioner for the Compliance Policy. He has also served in the Office of Global Regulatory Operations and Policy. Dr. Solomon has a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from Ohio State University and a Master's in Public Health from Johns Hopkins <laughs> University. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce to you Dr. Solomon. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you, Anna Marie, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the One Health Academy and the Society for Microbiology for hosting us here. Um, it's an impressive group tonight, so um, I'm hoping I can live up to the billing here. Um, I really want to spend time today sort of telling you a little bit about this Center for Veterinary Medicine, how we're integrating a One Health approach into our work to protect human and animal health. Just a little bit of more background to me. I, I think you heard it from many of the veterinarians in the room. When you go through a veterinary medical education, it's sort of intuitive that you sort of learn a One Health approach to, to issues as you sort of go through it. Particularly, my focus when I was in vet school was on preventive medicine that sort of reinforces that approach. And um, so, so it's, it's something I believe deeply in. And if I didn't do it enough, I've got um, my youngest daughter is just entered her fourth year of veterinary school, and she's uh, vice president of the One Health uh, group in vet school. And I've got T-shirts to um, to demonstrate that I'm part of that process. Um, so this is um, the great thing about CVM is I get to show all the pretty pictures as we sort of go along. But I want to spend some time sort of talking about um, the mission which is protecting human and animal health. So you can already see when our mission automatically sort of resonates with the One Health uh, process. I've worked all over FDA, as you sort of heard from Anna Marie. Uh, our folks in CVM are really committed to this mission. It's what drives them day in and day out. They're also passionate about animal health and welfare. We believe strongly that human health, animal health, and environmental health are all intrinsically linked. And we're using One Health approaches to solve public health challenges. So I hope today to be able to explain some more about that. You'll notice that we put human health first in our mission statement. Of course, we're committed to advancing animal health, but we don't think that animal health stands by itself. So let me give you a couple examples. I think everyone here is probably familiar with the concept of animals as sentinels for various zoonotic diseases. Several people sort of talked about that. But things that we've worked on, uh, I was the incident commander with many of the folks from this organization and others for when um, 
mad cow disease, bovine spongiform encephalopathy broke in 2003. And once again, the connection there is the fear was of new variant Crutchfield-Jacobs disease. So in December 2003, we spent time on BSE. And that first cow that came, well, was in Washington actually got put on, got rendered and got put on a boat. And part of my job uh, was to follow that boat as it circumnavigated the world because everyone considered it hazardous material. And every country I had to notify that there's a boat with this rendered cow on it, and they'd come and they'd put, you know, seals and stamps on it. It ended up, it circumnavigated the world. And in my office is a picture of like six months later, that boat coming back into the harbor when I could finally destroy that hazardous material. Um, I've been involved in many outbreaks and disease issues. One that you're probably familiar with was when we found melamine in pet food back in 2000. Uh, eight, 2007 in pet food. And it's probably the time I got more calls at home uh, from friends and relatives saying what pet food is safe for me to eat. What's interesting about that incident is we learned a lot in FDA about that. But because of that work, FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine developed a test to develop melamine, to, to be able to detect melamine. Why that connects to One Health is, if you remember in 2008, there was melamine in infant formula in China. And I was convinced that women with little babies would overthrow the government when infant formula had uh, melamine in it. Didn't happen that way. But the reason no melamine got into this country was because the, the tests we developed in CVM for the animal side allowed us to screen into the country so melamine didn't come into this country. A connection, once again, between human and animal health. And even the connections with, you may remember, um, outbreak um, where 175 people uh, died worldwide from 2007 to 2008 when heparin was co contaminated with oversulfated chondroitin sulfate. The connection there was there was what they call in China, blue-eared pig disease, what we call porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. And so heparin comes from the intestines of pigs. China was the major producer of heparin. The Chinese pig population was decimated, yet we were still seeing the same amount of heparin coming into the country. In hindsight, you could have solved that problem if you would have had put those pieces together. You look brilliant in looking back retrospectively, no one was sort of thinking of that way, but it shows the opportunity for One Health to solve uh, challenging public health problems. And of course, we deal with um, drugs and food for the human food supply. Uh, and so how we have to understand the human food supply, understand foodborne illness transmission, antimicrobial resistance, food ingredients that can become contaminated all along the food supply chain, is all critical from a One Health perspective. And last, let's not overestimate, underestimate the strength of the human-animal companion bond. You see it sort of every single day as animals for human and physical health and, and mental health capacity. American households have nearly 40, 400 million domestic pets. More than 67% of households have pets in them and more than 95% of these view their pets as part of the family. I just look at the little bumper stickers, the little things on the back of minivans, and there's the parents and the kids and the, the, the pets all sitting there, shows the strength of how important the human animal companion bond is. So let me talk a little bit about One Health at CVM. Um, probably not needed for this group, but let me just give the definition that we're using, which is the government definition. So One Health is a collaborative, multi-sectoral, and transdisciplinary approach working at the local, regional, national, and global level with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnection between people, animals, plants, and the shared environment. We got that out of the way. Um, so why is it important? I think everyone here probably knows it. I don't need to sell this. 75% of recently emerging infectious diseases affecting humans are of animal origins. 60% uh, of all human pathogens are zoonotic. 
80% uh, of potential biological threat agents are zoonotics, all you working in the biodefense areas. Um, and then we also see the reverse going on. We see uh, reverse zoonosis where transmission is going uh, from humans to animals. So let me tell you one of the stories from my experience that I think really brings One Health home. And it's the story of monkeypox. So monkeypox is a zoonotic disease found in West Africa that can cause human mortality. In 2003, the US experienced an outbreak of monkeypox. It was the first time human monkeypox was reported outside of Africa. Scientists at the Marshfield Clinic in Marshfield, Wisconsin, recovered a virus resembling a pox virus from one of the first patients and from the patient's pet prairie dog. That's a clue. Laboratory tests done at CDC included several PCR-based assays looking for pox virus DNA. They did electron microscopy, gene sequencing, and they confirmed that the agent causing the illness was a monkeypox virus. There were 47 confirmed and probable cases of monkeypox reported from six states during the 2003 US outbreak. How did this happen? So investigation determined that there was a shipment of animals from Ghana imported into Texas in 2003 that introduced monkeypox. The shipment contained 800 small mammals representing nine different species, including six genera of African rodents, rope squirrels, tree squirrels, African giant pouch rats, brush-tailed porcupines, dormice, and striped mice. So now the story gets interesting. So these rodents coming in from Africa went to a, um, a pet um, a location where different pets were being housed. And they were housed in close proximity to prairie dogs. One of the things I love about my job is you learn things. So I never knew up until this that um, people took prairie dogs as pets. And the way they do them is they take giant vacuum cleaners and they put them down a prairie dog hole and they suck out the pups. And then they take them back uh, to make them pets. These prairie dogs were sold as pets prior to the developing signs of infections. So here you have rodents sitting in um, a pet complex. You have prairie dogs in close proximity. No one in the new, new, no one in the world knew that prairie dogs were susceptible to monkeypox. These prairie dogs, not showing signs of any problem, went to pet stores. Parents bought them for their kids. Kids took them into what I used to call show and tell at school. All the kids started petting them, and kids got infected with prairie uh, with monkeypox. I was um, the incident commander for this issue. No one had a playbook to know how to deal with a foreign animal disease like this coming into the country. Um, I'll quote Anna Marie here. I was called into my boss's boss's office and told at the time, saying there's an outbreak of monkeypox. The Secretary of Health and Human Services has declared a public health order under the Public Health Services Act, you're in charge, eradicate this disease. I said, yes, sir. And I ran back by the office to say, what the heck is monkeypox? Because <laughs> I had no idea, either I slept through that lecture in school or they never taught it to me, but I, I didn't know what monkeypox was, but I learned a lot. And I rapidly started looking at our regulatory authorities and came to the conclusion that there was no single agency that had the authority or the resources to do to deal with this issue. And one of the great things about the federal government is in emergencies, people come together and really work together and sort of help each other out. So I had uh, to, to go, who's the acronym expert? Uh, we had every, every agency involved in this. There was the Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Disease Control, USDA, APHIS, state regulatory and public health officials, city and county officials. We needed to do so much. We had to stop and quarantine every animal that was potentially exposed through this process. People don't like when you say you're going to quarantine their animals and say they can't move. Um, I learned so much and we needed so many authorities. 
I needed APHIS to go into pet stores under some of their animal welfare laws. I needed the state of New Jersey, the um, Newark, New Jersey, because people, some people had their rodents, their African rodents, and they were so upset that the government was going to quarantine them that they went and released them at dumps. Wow. And so I had to have um, the state go out and start trapping rodents in a dump to make sure this didn't get into the domestic population. CVM had to put in a permitting system. So what I never understood about prairie dogs is that they cause a lot of damage when they dig tunnels, particularly at airports. So planes don't like to land where there's prairie dog holes that they're going to fall into place. So there was a routine process of um, moving prairie dogs outside of airports. We couldn't allow prairie dogs to be moved without a rational reason about why they had to be moved. You've been waiting for the environmental piece. You've been very patient with this. So then we find out, or we learned, that the black-footed ferret, an endangered species, eats prairie dogs. So if you've got to be careful about moving your prairie dogs to make sure you're not further endangering the black-footed ferret under the Endangered Species Act. This was a nightmare of trying to address this issue. The good news is that monkeypox was eradicated from the United States through the, the, all the tools that were used from multiple different agencies recognizing a One Health approach to try and address this issue. The bad news is I testified before Congress when this outbreak and explained why I was concerned about the vulnerability about the importation of some of these animals. CDC helped deal with the importation issue, but I gotta tell you, some of those same vulnerabilities still exist today as existed then. So I'm not sure we fully learned our lessons on it. And interesting to note, I just noted that there were some cases of human monkeypox in the UK late last year. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about um, CVM and FDA. Um, I didn't want to show you an org chart, and since it's my presentation, I tried to show this Venn diagram. Uh, it may not be quite the scale. Um, CVM is actually the smallest center here, but since it's my presentation, I'll make it as big as I want to make it. But the point I want to make sure is within FDA, we do a lot of work, uh, and CVM is a microcosm of the work that's going on. So... Um, we interact with all the rest of FDA. You've heard a bunch of acronyms. We work with the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. They work on gen genetically engineered products and stem cell and cell-based therapies, similar to um, work we do at CVM. We work on biopharma animals. For example, we have a biopharma goat that makes a recombinant antithrombin, which is an anticoagulant. They, they produces a human drug called Atrin, which prevents thromboemboli in patients with a hereditary antithrombin deficiency. So in their milk, we approve the goat. The Center for Biologics approves the drug product that comes out of those. And just as a reminder, USDA Center for Veterinary Biologics deals with vaccines, not Center for Veterinary Medicine. The Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, what we call CEDFR, the, we, we do um, new animal drug reviews except we have a few extra steps compared to what CEDAR does because for food producing animals, we need to make sure that when a drug's administered, that it's safe for human consumption and it doesn't contain harmful residues. We have an act called the Minor Use, Minor Species Act. Um, the major species, dogs, cats, horses, cattle, chickens, turkeys, and pigs, everything else is a minor species. So think of anything from uh, fish to elephants and um, they're species that we oversee the drugs that they're being used on. And we also use minor uses of some of these in major species. For example, chemotherapy for um, dogs uh, is going to be un under this uh, Minor Use Act. Center for Devices and Radiological Health, CDRH. CVM looks at veterinary devices only in the post market. We have some of the same concerns. Virtually every device you probably see used on humans is also used in the veterinary field. 
and we're even seeing things like Fitbits for cows, where people are monitoring uh, cows and they're uh, in a production herd and they're monitoring their temperatures to see if there's early signs of mastitis or metritis or other issues associated with that. Probably our closest center is our Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. We have a representative here. Uh, we look at issues through the supply chain. Um, one of the current issues that we're really dealing with is there's been a lot of recalls of pathogens in pet food. Um, there's been a series of, of products over years. Um, years ago, we had some problems with salmonella in dried kibble bits. We addressed that with the industry. We had some um, pet treats that were contaminated um, and we dealt with that issue that had salmonella. Now there are people are using raw pet foods. It, it's sort of a um, in vogue thing for some people. The problem with raw pet foods is it's got salmonella and listeria and E. coli's and we've had both people get sick, salmonella, they became septicemic, and we've had animals that have died uh, from the raw pet food. So it's an issue that we're tackling right now. Um, CTP stands for our Center for Tobacco Products. And you got to be saying, like, how is he going to make this one fit in? But the secondhand effects of smoke on animals um, is secondhand smoke affects just like people in the household. It's going to affect pets, too. But even worse is the thirdhand smoke. So thirdhand smoke is what happens with smoke and the nicotine. If it's in a house, it sinks down to the lowest level. So it sinks, sinks down to the carpeting and it sinks down to the sofa. In um, dogs, brachiocephalic dogs with pushed in noses, you'll see them getting more lung cancers. In dogs like have a really long nose, you'll see more nose cancers and, and houses where there's smoking on there. Um, so nicotine also concentrates in water. Um, pets sometimes uh, don't have the best habits. So sometimes they like to eat discarded cigarette butts, uh, which can cause problems. And we're even seeing challenges with um, e-cigarettes, these flavored packs and dogs are getting into them and eating them and getting uh, nicotine overdoses from them. Uh, we also work with the Office of Regulatory Affairs and international activities, but won't, sort of won't go into those. Um, so the org chart of, of, of sort of how we're organized um, is shown here. Um, so one of the aspects of One Health is it's very interdisciplinary. And we've got the expertise here. Uh, I'm afraid I don't think we have cultural anthropologists, but we'll have to think about doing that. But we've got veterinary medical officers, we've got animal scientists, animal nutritionists, we have environmental health scientists, physiologists, biologists and microbiologists, geneticists and molecular biologists, chemists, pharmaco pharmacologists, pharmacineticists, toxicologists, physical scientists, epidemiologists, I heard several of you in here, uh, mathematical statisticians, lots of other specialties. But it's how CVM works is in an interdisciplinary side because we can't solve our challenging public health issues by just looking at one discipline. We really need an interdisciplinary approach. So on the left, on the left hand side, you'll see the Office of New Animal Drug Evaluation. It's our largest office. They're looking to approve both pioneer and generic new animal drugs for the major species that I talked about. But we do um, innate, we, we do intuitively, we're required to look from a One Health perspective. So when we approve a new animal drug, we need to say, is it safe to the target animal? Is it safe for the user of that drug to administer that drug? Is it effective? Is there environmental safety concerns? We have to meet uh, NEPA requirements. If it's for food producing animals, it's gotta be a human food safety issue. If it's a uh, antibiotic, we've got to look at antimicrobial resistance uh, assessments. We have to look at how it's uh, the chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, and we have to do a look at the label review. So in our day-to-day -day work, we take a One Health approach as we're approving new animal drugs. Um, our binary use, I talked a little bit about. Uh, this is an area we're really trying to uh, incentivize. There's not enough drugs out there for all the species that you can imagine. Uh, I make fun of my um, all the rest of FDA's on the human side, they just got one species to deal with. Uh, we got the real work in Austin, we're the smallest center. 
Um, our Office of Research is, um, works on lots of One Health issues. Uh, currently, they're working on studies to investigate the absorption of ivermectin, which is an anti-parasitic in aquatic soils in support of questions about its potential impact on the aquatic environment. We work on bioequivalence issues to try and reduce and replace uh, the use of animals in research. We're working on standardizing cell culture approaches. Uh, somebody was doing studies on, uh, we work on metagenomic studies to investigate the interaction between antimicrobial drug resistance and the animal gastrointestinal biome. So this is work that we're doing that's One Health work on a daily basis. Our research campus have 166 acres that's located out in Laurel, Maryland. Our Office of Surveillance and Compliance does most of our post-marketing work. There's some representatives here from that office today. Um, they're looking at livestock feed safety, and just like we do on drug safety. They're taking a One Health approach, animals, humans, and the environment. Several of you mentioned uh, emergency response. Uh, unfortunately, we've been dealing with a lot of natural disasters over the past years, and we're both worried about um, companion animals. You've all seen the horrible signs of people in natural disasters and flooding trying to make sure they're saving their animals. And then the losses of uh, animal productions and food producing animals and horses during these livestock disasters. We're also worried about making sure there's enough food in these areas when natural disasters take place. So we spend a lot of time working on the natural disasters uh, for animals. We do um, post-market safety of vet drugs and food additives. Uh, we have similar challenges that there's compounded drugs as there are on the human side and these pose challenges. I'll spend a few minutes talking about our adverse drug experience reports that take place. We approve food additives. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's the same process as um, used on the new animal drug. We're looking at safety, effectiveness, and human food safety associated with it and the environmental issues. Uh, for sake of time, Office of Management handles our uh, logistics and uh, my center office focuses on international activities. You met some of our representatives there. So what are we doing on One Health? So that's sort of intuitive way we're doing things. Overtly, we're trying to do a lot more. Um, Betty, who introduced herself, is putting together with several other folks uh, a, a center-wide informal work group to enhance our One Health approach to it. Um, so we're bringing people together from all those disciplines and different components to spend more time within CVM thinking about One Health approaches. Um, the, if they're going to be sharing information and resources to CVM employees. They're going to raise awareness of the One Health principles, examples, and practices and they're going to organize and lead One Health activities. Um, last year, we were fortunate enough to celebrate One Health Day, and the former CVM director, many of you know, Dr. Bernadette Dunham, was our keynote speaker. Thank you again, Bernadette. I know you're online. And um, we're planning for CVM celebration for November 3rd, so there's planning activities for how we celebrate within CVM One Health activities. It, we're now expanding our work um, to help bring the other components of FDA uh, more strongly into the One Health component. So we're working with our Office of Chief Scientists to unify our One Health approach across FDA. We're proposing, not quite there yet, a One Health Center for Excellence in CVM. Many of you in different agencies have dedicated One Health offices. We would like to have a dedicated One Health office, so we're talking to um, uh, our leadership to try and move that forward. It's looking very positive at this point in time. We want to be requesting representation from all those acronyms that were on the outside of um, the Venn diagram to have representatives there. CVM is co-leading that with our Office of Chief Scientists. Our goal is to unify our One Health approaches across FDA's diverse portfolio. We want to make sure both the human and animal medical products, the safety and security of human and animal food supply, counterterrorism, preparedness, emergency response are all better coordinated under a One Health framework. And on the right side, um, I don't know how many people saw it. Another thing I learned, um, I'm, I'm not a social media person, but there's something called a tweetatorial. And uh, our former commissioner, uh, Dr. Gottlieb, on Sundays would do a tweetatorial 
you can go look it up um, there is November 8th. It was on the um, heels of last fall's One Health Day. He, can be, he dedicated one of his Sunday tweetatorials on One Health at FDA. It's actually worth taking a look at. He did a really nice job. We wrote it for him, but um, he sent it out. <laughs> um, and it shows the intersection connection of veterinary and human health and many of the things I'll be talking about. So you can check it out on Twitter at the hashtag Sunday tutorial and look for the day of November 18th. But it demonstrates our leadership's commitment to One Health. And then finally, we're part of the larger US government efforts on the One Health Federal Interagency Network. Uh, CDC has been leading this. Thank you very much, CDC, for doing that. I think everyone's acronyms probably mentioned here that's in the group. If I missed any, let me know. But this is a group we participate along with these other government agencies uh, in this approach, which is sharing One Health information across the government. And it's multi-sectoral. It's One Health coordination and communication. CVM is an active uh, participant in that, and we hope to get stronger over time. So doing things within CVM, we're doing things uh, from a One Health perspective to bring it stronger within FDA, and we're working in the um, interagency coordination aspect. So we're moving kind of on all fronts with that. And um, many of you talked about your international focus. We do a lot of work uh, internationally. Uh, Betty's our lead for much of this work. So we participate in the Office of International Epizootics uh, in development and review of the OIE Terrestrial and Aquatic Animal Health Codes. We, uh, CVM is a collaborating center for veterinary drug regulatory programs. Um, we also have tremendous expertise on anti-parasitic products, which is really a One Health prospect that we spend a lot of time working on those activities. The Veterinary International Conference of Har uh, Harmonization um, with EU and Japan, another activity that we work with our members at um, Animal Health Institute, the harmonized technical requirements for data for veterinary biological products for registration and, li and licensure. Uh, our goal is to, to be able to get more drugs approved across the world that can help with animal health diseases, many of them zoonotic diseases or prevention issues. We're also members of the Codex Alimentarius, which is part of the WHO FAO. Um, we're chair of the Codex Committee on Residues of Veterinary Drugs and Food. We're a delegate to that group, and we're also experts to the U.S. delegation for the Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance. So we're, once again, many animal uh, One Health approaches. So Codex establishes food safety standards, protect the health of consumers, and ensure fair practices. We also work with the WHO FAO Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives, it's called JECFA, and it's an independent risk assessment body that provides recommendations to Codex Committee on Veterinary Drug Issues. We work on the World Trade Organization aspects, and we started work with the Gates Foundation sponsoring the Global Animal Health Conference. Interestingly enough, I came across this the other day. Um, President Trump went to Japan in May 2019, and he met with Japanese Prime Minister Abe, and they had a discussion where they issued a statement on a reflection of 60 years of co cooperation between U.S. and Japan on health and biosciences. So they talked about recent breakthroughs in cancers and infectious diseases, food and drug safety, supporting the aging population, bioscience science technologies, influenza, emergency preparedness. Uh, and then they said U.S. and Japan shared objectives of making the world safer from pandemics, promoting One Health principles, and promoting bioscience globally. Strong sign for One Health that two countries got together and promoted a One Health approach. So I thought that was interesting information. All right, let me use some examples um, of products that I think demonstrate some unique aspects of a One Health approach. So we approved a novel animal drug product, and this is not a promotion for any single product, it's more the concept of the product. Uh, it's a novel animal drug product that supports a One Health approach to public health. As I mentioned before, and when we, we approve a new animal drug, we, we're following the One Health principles. It's gotta be safe to the animal, it's gotta be safe to the user, it's got to have that human food safety for food producing animals, 
We have to look at antimicrobial resistance issues and environmental safety. So last fall, November 2018, we approved Experior, which is the first animal drug that when fed to beef cattle under specific conditions results in less ammonia gas as a byproduct from their waste product. So it's a drug fed to, to beef cattle in confinement to reduce the levels of ammonia emissions. Um, I took it a little personal. We took a little ribbing in one of the press announcements and the, the quote was, FDA takes on flatulent cows, which was, was not exactly the headline I was hoping for. Um, but the point in the article itself was, hey, this is a drug that has a positive, can help work on environmental issues. So as you're probably familiar with, ammonia gas emissions can come from many sources, including the menorah beef cattle. And ammonia gas emissions are a concern. You can imagine if you're cleaning the house and you smell ammonia, it's noxious um, and it can cause uh, atmospheric haze issues. High concentrations of ammonia can cause irritation of the eyes, nose, and throat. I think both the humans and animals, I think probably everyone's experienced sort of cleaning your windows. Um, and in addition, um, ammonia gases can contribute to a process called eutrophication, which bodies of water become enriched with excess nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. The nutrient enrichment of the water causes algae bloom. Algae bloom causes blockage to the aquatic plants and eventually results in the death of aquatic animals to lack of oxygen. So I think you can see here in approval is a drug that works on the environment and it shows the recognition between health of people, animals, and the environment in that approval. So it's just an example. Um, and it's, it's one that we hope we'll see additional products sort of come forward for review by FDA. Um, I mentioned earlier, I talked a little bit about food additives. Um, so food additives follow the same principles I talked about before for new animal drugs. You have to look at target animal safety. You have to look at human food safety. We have to look at environmental safety. There's a lot of innovation going on in the food additive area particularly as people are using less, less antimicrobials, nutrition is becoming more and more important for folks to look at it. And the food ingredients we're seeing are becoming more complex chemicals that can be biotechnology products. So as part of regulating animal food, we look at does the food additive do what it's intended to do? Is it safe for the animals? And we look at both for pet food and livestock ingredients before they enter the market. Um, why is this important for animals? And I had some discussion with folks before, you need to recognize they don't eat the very diet that we eat every day. They're eating generally the same diet every time. So the safety and long-term use of that diet is really important. It's often the only ration and the only source of nutrition. If that diet's not right, that animal can have problems associated with it. So a couple of pictures here of, of things that I think fit the One Health approach. The top picture is a marine microalgae. This is single cell algae that we approved. It's formed to provide some omega-3 fatty acids for dogs. This advantage here, it saves pet owners from having the pet companies. They're using the algae which can be harvested and sustainable. You're not getting your omega-3 fatty acids from fish. So you're using a more sustainable source of products as a food additive. So we look at this, uh, the safety to the dogs and whether it's useful to the dog's diet and approve that product, but it's a One Health example. The disgusting picture on the bottom is black soldier fly larvae. Um, they're protein and oil for poultry, salmon, and some uh, soon other animals. These insects are being raised on food scraps, which traditionally would have just gone to waste and been buried. Instead, the insects turn the food scraps and into high quality food for animals. So we've looked at the fatty acid pro profile to see if it matched those needed by the chickens and fish and then determine the safety and usefulness. So once again, it's inherent in the work that we do. Um, animal biotechnology, hot area, uh, intentionally genomic altered animals, all sorts of technologies that are being used uh, to supplement this. We review those at the Center for Veterinary Medicine uh, I talked a little bit before about biofarm animals. 
In 2015, we approved a genetically engineered chicken, which produces a recombinant human lysosomal acid lipase protein in their egg whites. The drug name is Kanuma. It's an approved human therapeutic biologic purified from the egg whites. Um, it treats a rare lysosomal acid deficiency called Woman's disease. It's a rare inherited genetic disorder, but it, once again, CVM approved the chicken that it does what it's supposed to do. It's safe. And Center for Biologics reviewed the drug product that's coming, Biopharm Animals. Already talked to you about the genetically engineered goats. Uh, we have lots of GE animals for xenotransplantation for all sorts of disease conditions. Um, so that's a big area of focus. And then the potential for intentional genetic altered animals for being able to be resistant to uh, zoonotic diseases or animal diseases. Um, had discussions today at CVM about African swine fever uh, running rampant in parts of, of the world, not in the US at this point in time. If we could develop pigs that were resistant to that, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, major disease problem in pig populations, chickens with avian influenza, the list goes on and on, including issue diseases in honeybees that we're suffering from that intentionally genetic altered animals could have an impact on. Um, I think half the people in this room could probably do a better talk on the antimicrobial resistance, but you're stuck with me. Um, so I think everyone's already keyed in that antimicrobial resistance is one that we spend a lot of time on uh, with a One Health approach. Um, it's clearly a public health problem. Two million people are infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria. 23,000 people die in the US as a result, according to CDC. Um, obviously, the use of antimicrobials in human and veterinary medicine creates selective pressures for the emergence of resistant bacteria. Um, these, these can be transferred between humans and animals through direct or indirect contact via food and environmental rights. So we're spending a lot of time to preserve the effectiveness of antimicrobials for both human and animal health. We're looking at responsible antimicrobial stewardship. We spend lots of time talking to folks on this issue um, and making sure that um, new animal drugs are safe, effective, available to the market, but we also have a role in antimicrobial re resistance and making sure antimicrobial stewardship is a strong foundation. We're, met, we're part of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Compounding Antimicrobial Resistant Bacteria, PACCARB. We're one of the government representatives to that advisory committee. In 2015, they developed a national act, action plan for compounding antibiotic resistant bacteria. The goals, I'll just slow the emergence of resistant bacteria and prevent the spread of resistant infections. Two, strengthen national one health surveillance efforts to combat resistance advance the development and use of rapid and innovative diagnostic tests, accelerate basic and applied research and develop a new antibiotics, other therapeutics and vaccines, and improve international collaboration and capacities for antibiotic resistance prevention, surveillance, control, and research and development. Antimicrobial resistance knows no boundaries. So what have we been doing at CVM? A tremendous amount of work. Uh, all medically important antimicrobials, those are antibiotics that are both used in human and veterinary medicine, administered to food producing animals through feed and drinking water, were voluntarily converted to veterinary oversight. So drugs that used to be available prior to January 2017 over the counter, all need to be, go through a veterinarian. If it's an animal feed, it's called a veterinary feed directive. If it's um, uh, oral use, it's a prescription products. Um, and all production claims, so if it doesn't have a therapeutic claim, if it had for feed efficiency or growth promotion, those production claims have been withdrawn. It's part of our judicious use strategy, um, and this means that judicious use best occurs under veterinary oversight. There's been sales reports uh, that Congress has mandated that we produce. We issued um, last December the most recent sales report all medically important antimicrobials intended for use in food producing animals decreased by 33% between 2016 and 2017. All medically important antimicrobials decreased 43% since 2015, which was the peak year. 
and they decreased 28% since the first year that we started reporting, which was 2009. I'll give the caveat. Um, sales do not equate to actual use, but it is something that we're looking at uh, to monitor. So these are promising trends towards judicious use. Um, we're also working on additional guidances for industry. There's a few dosage forms that are still available, not in feed and water, uh, either intramammary or injectable that are available over the counter. They're all going to transition to prescription products. Uh, we are having some guidance that'll be out later this year. And some of the antimicrobials do not have an established duration of use for them. So we're working to uh, establish science-based limits on the duration of use of medically important antimicrobials. So that's another area that we're gonna focus on um, in the next year or two. We're updating the list of medically important antimicrobials to need to be refreshed. And we put out last year a five-year antimicrobial resistance plan uh, supporting antimicrobial resistance in veterinary settings. The goal was to align antimicrobial drug product use with the principles of antimicrobial stewardship, foster stewardship of antimicrobials in veterinary setting, and enhance monitoring. Another area that we want to focus on is we like companies to come in with alternatives to antimicrobials. So one of them that we approved was a product called Imrestor. It's a pegobovigrestin product. What that means, it's it's immune, it's immunostimulator. It's a drug that you give to dairy cows uh, before they give birth, and it stimulates the bone marrow um, to, to increase the number of neutrophils. So it bolsters the animal's innate immune system by causing an increase in neutrophils during the period of giving birth is a period where they're very susceptible to uh, various infections. So by doing this, it's an example of an alternative to antimicrobials. We'd love to see other products come on and be developed. Many of you are familiar with our National Antibiotic Resistance Monitoring System. Um, this tracks antibiotic resistance in foodborne pathogens. This is a collaborative process between CDC, FDA, and USDA. We disseminate timely information on antimicrobial resistance to promote interventions that reduce resistance among foodborne bacteria. We talk research to better understand the emergence, persistence, and spread of antimicrobial resistance. Um, NARMS is looking at clinical samples from ill people that you see on the left-hand side, retail milk samples from chickens, turkeys, cattle, and swine that FDA is looking for, and slaughter samples from chicken, turkeys, cattle, and swine that FSIS from USDA looks at. We're focusing on a number of different foodborne pathogens. We're expanding that list over time, and we put an annual report out there uh, to sort of monitor those activities. Um, VetLearn is an area um, that is um, a collaborative network of 43 veterinary diagnostic labs. Um, this is like, there's no CDC for animals. So this is sort of a substitute for where we do investigations. Uh, the epidemiologists, we, we need epidemiologists that would go out and study animal disease issues. Uh, we recently published um, an article um, that was co-authored co by the 25 collaborating vet learn laboratories. We looked at close to 2,000 isolates, performed whole genome sequencing on them. And I was talking to folks a little bit about this. This was one of the first whole genome studies to include companion animals in addition to our usual food producing animals. And one key finding was that some highly resistant bacteria from companion animals were found. I think it shows the human animal companion bond and the ability to transmit some of these diseases. So it shows the public health significance of incorporating companion animals. So we take a one health approach to AMR surveillance. Short story, uh, just to sort of, I gave you a bunch of numbers and issues, but one of the stories that sort of brings it home is antimicrobial resistance. Um, we worked with CDC and USDA APHIS. We investigated a multi-drug resistant Campylobacter infection in 113 people across 17 states. We had epidemiological and laboratory evidence that people had puppies coming from kind of puppy mills um, where it was the likely cause of the Campylobacter infection. 
We found inappropriate use of a lot of antimicrobials uh, in these puppies, leading them to develop resistance. Children went and go played with these puppies at pet stores. Children were hospitalized. Children were not responsive to some of the antibiotics that traditionally would have wor worked on Campylobacter. The hospital that they were in worked with CDC. CDC know, knows that we do a lot of whole genome sequencing and understand the genomics of resistant bacteria. We were able to identify uh, some antibiotics that would be effective in use form. We advised CDC, they told back to the hospital, they treated the children and they recovered, but it shows the collaborative approach to deal with these issues. Um, ivermectin, just an interesting story uh, from a One Health slant. Uh, ivermectin is a drug, all the veterinarians know, used for a long period of time, anti-parasitic problem. But in translational medicine, moving it from veterinary to human, they discovered that the drug was gonna be effective for river blindness Anca circa and people in Africa. So it's used as a therapeutic tradition. But then because we gathered information from a lot of human use, it allowed us to do the translation back and address some of the concerns about the tolerance and the residues because we had so much exposure to it. So working back between the human side. Post-marketing safety and effectiveness um, we have the largest pharmacovigilance database in the world on animal drug activities. Um, initial product safety, um, once a product's on the market, we get lots of information about these products. When we find signals of problems, then we try and move it forward. So two quick examples. Um, Altranogest is a um, proge synthetic progesterone product that's administered to horses uh, and pigs for their reproductive cycles. People handling this product, particularly women, were handling this product, getting exposure to this progesterone, having reproductive system disorders. We alerted the public and veterinarians about the side effects, potential routes of exposure, and um, worried about, gave advice on changing the labeling to use impervious gloves, use dedicated equipment, doping handling uh, the products associated with it. And just quickly, um, lots of other drug shortage issues, drug shortages in human medicine affects veterinary medicine too. Lots of veterinarians are using human drug products. We've had injectable shortages of injectable opioids that we tried to address at CVM to make sure veterinarians have adequate uh, medication to deal with pain in animals. Um, we also see problems that the opioid epidemic affects veterinarians. Unfortunately, some people were bringing in animals and asking for opioids for their animals when they were using for themselves. And even sadder, some people were hurting their animals in order to get opioids, so really concerning issues. And with that, I know I went long, um, but I thank you for the time and I'll let you decide how much questions you can allow. Appreciation from oh. the One Health Academy. So thank you so much for thank sharing you. your time and your information with us. We're all really grateful uh, to be a part of the One Health community with you. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'm really honored. Appreciate it. And we are short on time, everyone. So I'll take two or three questions, and then I encourage everyone, because we want to be respectful to our venue, to move outside and continue your networking. There's Tabard Inn where some of us will help, or we'll we'll head over or anywhere in Dupont at your so, two or three questions for Dr. Solomon before we close up tonight? That's a shock. <laughs> okay, all right. Sorry, I'm Dr. Solomon. It's a very nice uh, overview of FDA one and what you do. I mean, everything FDA, uh, uh, CBM in particular does affect other agencies as well. SIS. One example is uh, the diagnosis experience just through for the in a cow that uh, control uh, ammonia production. So we're like talking about them ourselves. Like, should we start to test? Because it's all teamwork. You guys set up the level approval new drug, and then we have to start to test, make sure they are used accordingly. 
So do you have any, uh, I guess, insight uh, as the in so um, every time we do an approval for a food producing animals, we have to establish a tolerance. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head what it is, but we notify FSIS routinely on every new approval and sort of work with them to establish what the test, both what appropriate testing mechanisms are and what the levels are. Um, but I, off the top of my head, I can't remember what that is for that. But you can look up the Freedom of Information Act that's posted. Um, on our website and it would have that information on it. But we routinely let you guys know because you do the testing for us on residues. And thank you for that. And thank you for your excellent talk. Um, I am a grad student at a vet school. I'm married to veterinarians, surrounded by a lot of veterinarians. And I hear um, so much passion for one health and it makes sense, but I don't get the same sort of feedback from medical students or from the human side. So I'm wondering how um, you think we can uh, garner their interest besides you know, scrim offering. Um, so um, great question. Um, I was sort of fascinated when my daughter, I'm sort of living vicariously through vet school again, which is a scary proposition to my daughter. Um, but they actually bought the, the, they have stronger connections when there's vet schools associated with a medical school. So for example, some medical schools and vet schools have one health groups that sort of routinely meet. I think it happens at during training. And one of the aspects is um, the veterinarians had the medical students come over and when they were doing their um, anatomy class, um, the, the medical students participated and then the vet students went over and looked at cadavers on um, with the medical students. So I see, I see signs of some of those working together on a One Health approach, but that's part of the reason when I sort of gave this, the, the second part of that three-part slide saying within CVM, I've got people so vested in One Health, part of our job now is can I bring the rest of the organization along? And I think there's a lot of interest. Um, hi, again, and thank you for your talk. So when I gave my introduction, I did mention that I work at USDA, FSIS. I did not mention that I'm also a veterinary and um, epidemiologist there, but I do practice part-time as well, cats and dogs. And um, what we're seeing a lot in the clinic is a lot of interest in CBD products for pets, as well as marijuana um, <laughs> usage, um, THC oils, and then also overdoses from pets getting into odorous brownies and other things. Is that something, I know you mentioned with the opioids crisis, but is that something that CVM is looking into as well? So uh, <laughs> FDA a week ago from last Friday uh, hosted a public meeting on CBD that included asking a bunch of questions about animal use as well as human use. Um, it was an overwhelming response. Uh, the room was packed. Uh, there were like seven TV cameras and there were over a thousand people on the webinar and the room held 500 people. Um, everyone's got the questions. We are anxious for people to come in with studies to show that the product is safe and effective for use. Uh, there's one product approved for humans for seizures. We'd love to see products coming to demonstrate it, but there's no data to support this activity. And we'd love to see the data. All right, I'm so sorry, forgive me guys. We're over on time. So please still ask your questions, Dr. Solomon, as we exit, but wanted to just make a few quick announcements for One Health Academy um, that we are having summer breaks. So next month in July and August, we will not have our, it's our two months out of the year that we don't have speakers. So please enjoy your summer. And we're also always looking for speakers. So if you yourself are thinking you see yourself up here or a colleague or anyone, we want to continue the discussion and take your perspective into account. So please consider it. Please reach out. Happy to speak to anyone. So grateful for your time tonight and everyone's super busy. So thank you for being here and thank you for supporting us. And look forward to seeing you all.